Good evening and welcome to the April 22nd Bloomington Planning Commission meeting. The Planning Commission advises the City Council on development proposals, development standards, long-range planning and transportation issues. Some of the items the Planning Commission has the final decision authority, others the City Council will make the final decision. The Planning Commission is made up of seven volunteers and tonight we have six so we do have a full quorum. But before we begin tonight, let's stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Mr. Markegaard, before we get started tonight, do you want to go through the... Uh, process for those uh, at home and how they can join the join us tonight sure uh, mr. chairman commissioners good evening uh, this is our 25th remote planning commission meeting uh, since the pandemic uh, began we have just two people here in the chambers uh, this evening everybody else is uh, remote and but you can still definitely call in to testify we have three public hearings so if you'd like to testify, just call uh, the number on the screen, 1-888-742-5095. And then once you're in, uh, enter the conference code 846-100-1098. And we will have this uh, number scrolling across the screen uh, this evening. And uh, that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Mr. Markegaard. And just a little bit. Additional information for those at home who would like to join us tonight. Typically, how the process goes is the staff will give a staff report um, on the uh, item in front of us. The city uh, or the uh, planning commission staff uh, then are available for, for questions from the planning commission. And usually we would go to the applicant and if they have anything additional to offer. And at that point, we would open up the public hearing. And I will ask uh, Mr. Markegaard if there's anybody online uh, that would like to speak to the item and we'll go through our operator to which they will let you know when it's your turn to speak. And at that point, just if you have any questions, please address them to myself as the chair. And if the Planning Commission uh, would like additional discussion on those, we'll take those up. We will not uh, necessarily answer those questions directly. Um, and then after everybody's had a chance to speak, usually uh, we give three minutes initially and then additional rounds if there's additional comments needed. Then uh, the uh, Planning Commission will close the public hearing and enter into uh, discussion about the item before making a motion. All right, with that said, uh, let's see. Our first item of the night is a preliminary and final plat, and I believe Mr. Palermo has a staff report for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, we can. All right. So I'm here to present uh, the Fairchild Edition, a Type 3 plat at 4223 West Old Shakopee Road. There we go. Uh, this should look familiar to you. We previously had discussed this, so we, uh, we had kind of uh, talked about this, but this property is located on Old Chocopee Road, and it's a through lot that also connects to the south on 108th Street. Um, and the applicant is proposing to subdivide this into two lots. There'll be a lot to the north and a lot to the south. So the property is zoned R1. There is an existing single-family home, and they're proposing to split it to provide uh, a new lot for another single-family home on the south side at 108th Street. As you might remember, at our previous discussion, this property is guided in our uh, guide plan as medium density residential. And as we discussed at that time, uh, the property is zoned R1, which has a maximum of just under four units per acre, but the medium density residential had a minimum of five units per acre. So at that time, we were discussing the comprehensive plan amendment, a text amendment, which would add language that would say um, uh, that this would be appropriate to go below that minimum if net density was increasing, if it was on a local street, and if it, uh, the new lot is adjacent to a single family on both sides. 
this comprehensive plan amendment has been approved by council and was approved by the Met Council, Metropolitan Council, so now it is uh, effective in our comprehensive plan, so it would be applicable here today. So looking at uh, what is being proposed, you can see they'll have uh, basically just a line down the middle to create that second lot that fronts 108th Street. So some things that we look at for the R1 standard um, is minimum lot size. Both lots meet minimum lot size. Um, the minimum lot width for this area, the prevailing lot width happens to be also the minimum lot width for our R1 zoning, which is 80 feet. Uh, the proposed lot width would be 118 feet, so we're okay there. And then minimum setbacks, we wanna be able to, if we're creating a new lot, make a buildable lot. And you can see here, and it's kind of hard to see here, so I tried to make it a little bit bigger on the screen, but this was included in your packet. Um, the square on the south lot, the new lot, is kind of the buildable area. So there's plenty of area to build uh, on this new proposed lot. And the existing lot doesn't create any uh, new nonconformities. Um, it's, uh, the rear setback is still met, and it's just an existing building that will continue to be there. So as part of the conditions of improvement uh, uh, or of approval, uh, we have right-of-way dedication. These are all pretty typical and standard that we do with our plats. Um, drainage and utility easements, uh, sidewalk or bikeway easements on uh, Old Shakopee. You know, we've got the sidewalk. Uh, park dedication as part for the new lot and the sewer availability charge, the SAC charge. And then other applicable codes would be tree preservation. Uh, I included here the, the sidewalk waiver. So on 108th Street, there isn't currently a sidewalk. We do have a requirement that new developments incorporate a sidewalk, but we think this might be appropriate to petition council for a waiver. Um, this is just something that we would um, recommend to the applicant when they get to that part of the process um, so that they be able to construct the sidewalk when appropriate. This uh, street, 108th Street, is on our uh, pavement management program to be uh, reconstructed fairly soon. So we'll, they'll coordinate with our um, utilities, our public works department on those improvements and driveway access and all that. And of course, utility connections for the new house. So to approve the preliminary plat, uh, we have to make findings. Um, in this case, these are a rundown of all the, the findings that staff believes they've made. So comprehensive plan, with that new comprehensive plan amend text amendment, the finding is made that this is consistent with our comp plan. Uh, it, there isn't a district plan for the area, so it's not in conflict with any district plans. Uh, it's not in conflict with city code. Again, we recommend that petition and waiver for the sidewalk requirement, but um, that can come later. Um, it's not in conflict with any existing easements. Uh, there is adequate public infrastructure to serve the new lot. There's a road, there's utilities. Uh, our stormwater standards are applicable, uh, impervious coverage. Uh, emergency services are only adding one lot, so still, um, into an existing neighborhood, so not an issue, schools, et cetera. So there aren't any additional um, issues created with the new development. Uh, similarly, there's nothing to really mitigate with environmental aspects. Uh, and the plat is not detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare. And the plat is not uh, in conflict with any approved development plans. So here's the final plat. And for the final plat, the findings are that it's not in conflict with the preliminary plat. Uh, I will say, including your packet, we did have correspondence from one resident who uh, was in support of the application. Pretty simple letter, just saying, stating they were in support, and that's the only correspondence we've received so far. Um, with that, it's pretty straightforward. If any questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Palermo. Um, Planning Commission members, any questions for staff on this one? Not seeing any. Uh, we'll go to the applicant. Mr. Markegaard, is the applicant available tonight? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, let me check in with one call-in user. Well, there's two call-in users. I'll check in with both to see if they are the applicant. 
uh, call in user area code 651. I will unmute you now. This is Jill. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Go ahead. Go Hi. ahead. You're uh, Jill. Uh, anything to add to the uh, staff report or anything for the planning commission to know? Nope. I can't think of anything else. Michael did a good job. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Markergard, with that, we'll go ahead and we'll open the public hearing on the uh, preliminary and final plat. Is there anybody online from the public that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have had nobody pre-registered, but we'll check in with Mr. Pease to verify we have anybody. Mr. Pease, you are unmuted now. There is no callers on the line. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pease. All right. Planning Commission members, seeing uh, that there is nobody from the public that would like to speak to this item, I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Commissioner Roman? So moved. All right. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Commissioner Cookton? Second. All right. Planning Commission members, we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any further discussion on that? All right, all those in favor of closing the public hearing at this time say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Abdi? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I from myself, motion passes. Public hearing on this item is now closed. Uh, discussion, commission members? Anything you'd like to add or... Uh, to this commissioner roman thank you mr chair um pretty straightforward i think we discussed it a fair bit uh, during the comp plan amendment uh, my only comment is uh, i'm not in favor of either uh, recommending or encouraging a waiver of sidewalk um, we've had projects before where sidewalks may not have one on either side and that's our requirement so um that's my only comment otherwise i'm supportive of this all right thank you commissioner roman any other uh, commissioners that'd like to speak to this item? I myself will say I'm also in support of this uh, preliminary and final plat. And um, uh, obviously we did work um, on this a couple months ago and I think we're generally familiar with it. Uh, it's good to see an additional home being built in Bloomington. All right, commission members, uh, any further discussion? Otherwise I'd entertain a motion. Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In case PL 2021 6 0, having been able to make the required findings, I move to recommend approval of a type three preliminary and final plat to create two lots from an existing lot for a new single family home at 4223 West Old Shakopee, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. All right, Commission members, we have a motion uh, to approve the preliminary and final plat. Is there a second? Commissioner Abdi? Second. All right, Commission members, we have a motion and a second to move to recommend approval of a type three preliminary and final plat to create two lots from an existing lot for a new single family home at 4223 West Old Shakopee subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Abdi? Aye. Commissioner Cookton? Aye. And I for myself, motion passes. This item will now move to the May 3rd City Council meeting as a consent agenda item. All right, that concludes item number one for tonight. Item number two, final site and building plan for 9641 James Avenue. Mr. Centenario, I believe you have the staff report. <clears throat> Mr. Chair? Yes. Go ahead. This is Commissioner Cookton. I would like to abstain from both items number two and number three tonight as I have a business relationship with them and want to avoid a conflict of interest. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Cookton. That is duly noted. You'll be abstaining from items number two and three tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, item number two in your agenda is for uh, final site and building plans 
uh, for a building addition to an industrial uh, existing industrial building at 9641 James Avenue. So here we have the site. Uh, you can see it, it, it looks vacant in this particular image. Uh, but for the past several years, this site has been used by or owned and used by a landscape contracting business. And so you might, you might have driven past it and seen a lot of landscape uh, material and trucks. Uh, well, that, you know, thankfully that business uh, was successful and needed more space. So they relocated uh, to a different site within Bloomington and uh, sold this site to the applicant. And the applicant is Archetype Signs and they are located immediately north at 9611. So you see the large building to the north, uh, they operate uh, their office and uh, production facility at that site. So they need to expand and uh, they purchased uh, the site that we're discussing today. So here you can see a, just a, a street view image of uh, the building on the corner. So obviously you can see the relationship between Archetype, their existing facility, and uh, the landscaping uh, business that used to be uh, at the site. So it's a, it's a smaller building uh, and in the rear or the east of the building was used for uh, landscaping materials and, and trailers and such which, which some, with some uh, parking area uh, in the front along uh, James Avenue. So here we have the, the site plan. You can see this is on the corner between James and West 97th Street. The rectangle in yellow is the addition area or the, the building addition itself. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not a huge addition by any means, but it, it did exceed the threshold for planning manager review. Uh, so there's certain, uh, the planning manager has the ability to, to review and approve projects up to a certain size. And when you have a building that's relatively small to begin with, it, ju it just doesn't take that much uh, to trigger that threshold requiring planning commission review. Uh, but that's okay, so that, that's uh, before we tonight. But in terms of our <clears throat> city code requirements, uh, the, the site would meet uh, our landscape yards, both on uh, along both street frontages. They exceed the parking requirement by a couple stalls. They have some stalls to the on the west side of the building, but then they would be retrofitting some uh, parking stalls on the east where the uh, landscape material used to be. A little bit of discussion on sidewalk. You know, when we have uh, building additions like this, uh, there's a certain trigger where, if it exceeds a certain percentage, you have to you have to widen sidewalks in certain circumstances, and this is one of those. So right now, the sidewalk along uh, in front of the building is is only uh, six feet wide, actually five or six feet wide, whereas the requirement is eight feet. And so when the site to the north uh, redeveloped uh, back in 2015, 2016. Uh, a similar scenario where they had to widen, uh, they had to widen that sidewalk uh, to eight feet. And so there's a similar requirement here, uh, which the applicant uh, is showing on their plan. So they would be compliant, code complying there. Also a uh, requirement for the expansion is landscaping. And so there, there isn't much landscaping material on site today. Uh, so the, but they would have to meet both the quantity of trees and shrubs but then also the uh, parking lot screening requirement, uh, which you can see they're, they're accommodating with a mix of shrubs and perennials. And so this would be a you know, pretty significant aesthetic improvement uh, from what is there today uh, with the inclusion of curb and gutter uh, around the parking lot, which doesn't exist today. Uh, over six, seven uh, street trees or boulevard trees. Uh, so pretty significant changes. In terms of building elevations, again, the, you can see the existing building in just white, and then you see the addition, which is proposed to be uh, block, and which is a really common uh, material for industrial buildings. And so we do have a couple standards related to uh, block. We do not allow like your, your traditional flat-faced block. It has to be more decorative. And uh, so the applicant's been aware of that and they are they're comfortable with that requirement uh, that is more decorative and also integrally colored. Uh, so it's not uh, a painted exterior. But with that, we are recommending approval. Um, and so this is an application that uh, the Planning Commission has a final authority on. Uh, an appeal uh, within three business days. Uh, with that, I'm available for questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Center. 
Mr. Centenario. Uh, commission members, any questions for staff on this? Not seeing any questions. Uh, Mr. Markegaard, is the applicant available? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Eric Reiners is available representing the applicant. All right, thank you. Mr. Reiners? Are you there? Yeah, Mr. Reiners, you can unmute yourself now. And in case that's not working on your end, I'm going to unmute you on my end. All right. Ooh. Mr. Reiners, are you I there? Think I'm good. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, commissioners and chair. Um, uh, my name is Eric Reiners. I'm a principal at SRA, and we've been assisting Archetype in this uh, in this small project. Um, Archetype acquired a uh, related business uh, specializing in metal finishing and um, a certain part of the process of of their manufacturing, and they are relocating that business from um, Chanhassen uh, to this building uh, directly adjacent to their existing um, facility. Um, they're going to bring about 15 jobs to the city of Bloomington, and uh, they're excited to have this uh, this capacity and uh, added process um, closer to their existing building. Um, we work closely with staff. Um, you just heard some of the unique requirements uh, associated with getting the building and and sites up to uh, current codes. Um, and I believe uh, we've done the best we could with uh, what we got to work with uh, the limited uh, frontage uh, that we had to uh, fit the landscape requirements into. And uh, and we're going to do our best to, to meld the, the finishing of that building into its site and uh, and context. So with that, I'll uh, I'll stand by for any questions you might have for me. Thank you, Mr. Reiners. Appreciate uh, your participation tonight. Uh, commission members, any questions for Mr. Reiners? All right, not seeing any questions for you right now, Mr. Reiners. Appreciate it again. Uh, and thank, thank you, you very much. All right, Mr. Markegaard, do we have anybody from the public that would like to speak to this item? Uh, Mr. Chair, nobody has pre-registered, but let's check in with Mr. Pease. Mr. Pease, do you have any callers on the line? There are no callers on the line for this item. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I guess this will be easy since a public hearing is now open on this. And there is nobody from the public. Commission members, is there anybody who would like to make a motion to close the public hearing? Commissioner Albrecht. So moved. All right. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Commissioner Corman? Second. All right, Commission members, we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Is there any further discussion on that? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Abdi? Aye. And I, for myself, motion passes. Public hearing is now closed on item number two. Commission members, any uh, discussion on this item? I will say for myself, I'm happy to see that we have two success stories of businesses in Bloomington. Um, certainly know the landscape business that was there and um, am happy to see that this is an expansion of an existing Bloomington business and bringing more jobs to the city. I think it's a minimal change um, and can support it with the uh, uh, improvements to the site plan. Any other commission members? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion. Commissioner Roman. I was just going to say I, too, am um, pleased to see successful businesses in our community and happy to make a motion unless others have something to add first. All right, looks and like you're back, in. I guess, uh, in case PL 2021-59, having been able to make the required findings, I move to approve final site and building plans 
for a 1,440 square foot building expansion and site improvements at 9641 James Avenue South, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Roman. All right, Commissioner members, we have a motion to approve the final site and building plans. Is there a second? Commissioner Corman. Second. All right, commissioners, we have a motion and a second to move to approve the final site and building plans for a 1,440 square foot building expansion and site improvements to 9641 James Avenue South, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albert. Aye. Commissioner Abdi. Aye. And I for myself, motion passes. That is a final decision unless an appeal is received by 4.30 p.m. on April 27th. All right. Thank you, Mr. Centenario, for that staff report. All right. Moving on to item number three tonight, which is Bloomington Central Station Phase 4. Mr. Johnson, I believe you have a staff report for us. And again, I do. just want to oh, uh, let Sorry. the public know that Commissioner Cookdown is abstaining from this. Uh, item. Go ahead. Good Mr. evening. Johnson. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. Um, so, yes, before you this evening is uh, the fourth phase of Bloomington Central Station. I know the applicant is very excited uh, to present this project to you. Uh, Bloomington Central Station, of course, is a, uh, a well-known or significant development in Bloomington, and this is the, the fourth phase of a multi-phase uh, plan development. So they are seeking uh, multiple zoning approvals from you this evening, a uh, major revision to the preliminary development plan for BCS. Uh, we'll refer to it a lot as that, BCS, and uh, final development plans for phase four, so the phase that they're bringing to you this evening, and then a platting action. There's also an application that's been made for an airport zoning uh, permit uh, that is an administrative action and does not require uh, your consideration this evening. And again, the applicant is McGough development. There's multiple parcels involved, multiple addresses. So I mentioned uh, kind of the, the various components, more specifically, the major revision to the PDP involves significant uh, changes to the Northwest quadrant of the development. We'll get into those, uh, but generally replacing three planned office towers and associated parking structures uh, in that portion of the development with uh, multifamily residential and uh, mixed with a retail component, uh, multifamily buildings. Uh, the final development plans for you this evening is the 400 phase or 405 unit uh, apartment building. Uh, it's a six story building uh, with a grocery store, uh, which is a significant development for the uh, for the area. And then other related site improvements in the BCS development. And then the platting action would plat the lot for uh, phase four and create some private outlots for uh, streets. And I mentioned the airport zoning permit. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the uh, subject area. So Bloomington Central Station, as I as I said, it's a well-known area. You have the health partners. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, office tower in the southern portion of the development. Uh, the uh, Reflections Condominiums, where I just saw uh, Commissioner Cook <laughs> uh in his humble abode there um, on the southeast corner. And then uh, the Hyatt Regency Hotel uh, in the northern portion of the development. And then you have Indigo and Fenley on the east side of the development along 34th Avenue. Uh, of course, the Central Park in the center of the development. And uh, the, the, the portion of the development we're going to talk about tonight is in the northwest. Those parcels are identified in yellow. In terms of surrounding uses, you have the Metro Office Park to the north across American Boulevard. Uh, to the west, you have uh, one of Excel's uh, electrical substations uh, here in the area. Um, the, the, the Metro Transit Park and Ride is not far by. Um, uh, and then, of course, the Bloomington Central uh, Station development to the south and east. Um, of course, the Blue Line LRT runs through the uh, right through the middle of this development, and it's a significant component of it. Um, so that's the area map, uh, getting to just an oblique image of what we're looking at. So this just gives you a sense of kind of the existing condition as it stands today. Uh, my previous aerial was just from 2018. So the Fenley has just uh, been substantially completed. Uh, you can see here, which was uh, the, the second 
phase of that uh, residential after Indigo. Um, and yeah, this kind of just provides you an overview of what is out there today. Um, the area that we're talking about tonight is the surface parking lot. It's been used for construction phasing and other uh, kind of uses um, uh, to, to serve the BCS development, uh, but that's what it looks like currently. Just providing a general history of this development. Again, the, the PDP was uh, originally approved in 2004, and that was part of the Reflections uh, Condos Action. Um, in 2006, they got approval for the uh, Central Park. Uh, in 2013, both Indigo and uh, the Hyatt Regency Hotel were approved. And as part of that action with Indigo, that was the last major revision of the preliminary development plan. In 2018, they got uh, approval of the Fenley, which has since been constructed. Uh, so that just provides you a general uh, timeline of what has occurred out there uh, since 2004, when this uh, project started to materialize. Get into the existing preliminary development plan. So uh, the, the, the whole site is shown here on the left side of the slide. The northwest corner is blown up here on the right side of the slide. Uh, here you can see that there, here's the location of those three office towers. Uh, so fronting along uh, um, 31st Avenue and there was parking structures planned along 30th Avenue on the outside portion of the development. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, kind of reasons of what they're looking at uh, for these changes. Um, there's been a significant shifts in the, the suburban office market uh, in, in the last 15 years, uh, as well as uh, something that we'll talk about with respect to residential. Um, but, you know, showing this is their revised PDP now. Uh, this is showing uh, those residential buildings in that northwest corner uh, here showing another slide. Um, Kind of that area blown up, but another critical factor that informed not only um, not only the the kind of market related forces, but uh, over this period of time, the uh, noise impacts related to MSP International Airport have changed uh, in this area, uh, providing less noise. Uh, this area used to be in the 70 uh, DNL noise contour area, which was a higher level. And it since has receded just due to changes in operations at MSP in terms of what runways they utilize for which types of planes, uh, in addition to actually improved technology on the part of uh, plane manufacturers as well to generate less noise. Um, but this area no longer is within that 70 DNL area. Um, it's now subject to a 60 area and uh, the base underlying zoning district uh, for BCS, the HXR zoning district had within it a component of limiting residential uses in areas that uh, were prone to be subject to these higher noise levels. Certainly it can uh, be a conflict. Uh, noise you know, is gonna have the greatest impact on residential uses. So this area was never available for residential development until these changes uh, occurred um, in the, over the last few years here um, as a result of these changes at uh, MSP. So, this area is now available for residential. It's very much in keeping with the intent or the, the vision for the HXR district. There's always been a very strong emphasis on res, high density residential land uses uh, associated with that zoning district. Uh, so this is the, the change that they're proposing now is to replace those three office towers, which would have been just shy of uh, a million square feet of office space. What they're proposing to replace it with is BCS phase four, BCS phase five, and BCS phase six, which would total, uh, you know, 900 and uh, I believe 925 uh, residential units as approved here in the PDP, um, and uh, as well as 26,000 square feet of retail space. So they are similar to the other phase, residential phases of BCS. They are programming in residential uses uh, to give it that mixed use uh, component. Um, in terms of analysis of these PDP revisions, uh, they are slightly increasing the overall FAR of the development, but HXR does build in some bonuses uh, for floor area. And uh, given the affordable component of not only phase four, but also phases five and six, uh, they're gonna greatly, ex they're gonna have more than enough uh, floor area bonus to cover all of these uses as they're showing uh, you in this PDP revision. So they will be uh, code compliant with respect to FAR. Um, just to note that the traffic division did require a traffic study be done of these changes, given the significant nature of uh, of the the patterns and of, of these different uh, land uses. And uh, the traffic study was uh, completed and did not identify any significant issues. Uh, so that's positive. Um, and uh, 
Uh, the only recommendations that uh, came out of the traffic study uh, as far as public improvements goes, uh, fortunately already uh, were part of other planned uh, city projects within the South Loop area as part of their CIP. If there's questions about the staff report, Brian Hansen uh, is on the call uh, tonight if there's any questions about that. Uh, in addition to the uh, other major, uh, or I guess the more permanent or uh, components of the, the PDP revisions, uh, there is an interim phase sheet shown. And the reason being is that uh, on a permanent basis, uh, surface parking is highly discouraged in the HSR zoning district. It actually caps and limits the amount of surface parking you can have as a permanent condition. Um, certainly there's a lot of surface parking uh, out here currently, and that's what this development seeks to reduce overall is the amount of surface parking in the area. Uh, but this does include an interim phase sheet showing uh, additional parking highlighted in yellow. Uh, and the reasons for that has to do with just creating additional parking supply on the interim basis for the Hyatt Regency Hotel uh, until such time that a parking ramp uh, could be constructed in closer proximity to the hotel as part of uh, future phases of BCS. There's an office building and uh, a ramp planned for this area surrounding uh, the hotel. And so until that uh, phase of development comes to fruition, uh, they would prefer to just add a small amount of surface parking on this outlot queue area as shown uh, in yellow. Uh, staff is uh, find that does staff does find that acceptable again just as an interim phase um, the permanent uh, PDP uh, ultimately what is approved um, is not uh, does not change with respect to this just interim phasing uh, approval or request so just a note about that this is the final development plans of the six story uh, 405 unit uh, apartment building and again, you can see here in the northeast uh, corner of the development, uh, this is the proposed grocery store. Um, I've tried to get it out of the applicant as to who the uh, plan tenant is. They have not revealed that quite yet, although maybe they're more receptive to your uh, questions than mine. Um, but they are uh, showing the grocery in the northeast corner. So that'll take up two stories um, and is a significant space and a, uh, would you know be a great benefit to this area and South Loop in general. Um, in terms of other components of the residential development, you know, it's very similar to uh, what you see at Indigo and Fenley uh, in terms of that the, uh, the structured parking ramp is in the, the center of the development and the residential components of the building wrap uh, the structured parking uh, within the, in the center. Um, they are proposing many of these amenity courtyards that they also have at some of their other residential developments in the area. So there's a swimming pool, uh, other amenities, fire pit, uh, barbecue. Um, you know, uh, these are highly heavily landscaped and uh, nice amenity areas uh, within the development. Um, along the south here, um, and we'll talk about kind of other components of the project in a minute, but um, the, what they're proposing here is a uh, kind of a uh, shared use type corridor. Certainly the majority of the time it's intended to be a pedestrian and bicycle corridor along the light rail tracks on the south side, um, but also serves as uh, emergency access uh, should the fire department uh, need to utilize that facility for any reason. It does have uh, a landscape component. And so uh, the fire department has been uh, um, uh, good in working with the, the, the developer on ever other phases of the development in order to achieve a corridor that helps serve their fire access, but also, uh, you know, has a, a nice planted uh, amenity and uh, design uh, just to make it an attractive area for pedestrians. Um, other aspects of just the, the, the um, site plan here, they are constructing East 80th and a half street on the north side of the development. They're showing typical parallel street parking on the northwest corner, 90 degree parking on the northeast corner. Again, this is really that grab and go quick uh, surface parking for the grocery store. A um, little bit of an innovative or unique design. It is a slightly elevated uh, parking deck. So there's just a very slight or subtle incline uh, as you go up and down. And that's intended really to slow people down as they're going through there. They anticipate a lot of pedestrians uh, in that area. Um, so that is a uh, benefit. Um, so yes, constructing uh, East 80th and Half Street, this, the parking ramp would have two uh, me means of ingress and egress. There's a driveway over here on the east side, and then there's access here on the north side. The truck dock that serves the proposed grocer is here. If 
you can see my uh, mouse recursor on the, at the northwest corner of the grocery. So that's where they would make their deliveries. And then this east side also includes a uh, turnaround uh, and uh, access for the, the apartment building, which has a couple different uh, uh, main entrances. So other elements of the final development plans, they are constructing uh, 31st Avenue South as well, um, in between American Boulevard and down to this turnaround, as you can see here, um, connection across the light rail tracks, which is you know part of the, of course, the future vision and future phases uh, would be made all the way down to East Old Shakopee Road at full build out of this phase development. Uh, but at this point, uh, as part of phase four, it, it terminates here at this location. Um, these images on the right side of the slide are just uh, zoomed in shots of the kind of amenity courtyards that would serve the, uh, re the apartment building. So in terms of uh, compliance with the city's opportunity housing ordinance, this uh, apartment has 405 units. So to meet the minimum requirement, they would have to provide 36 units at uh, affordable to uh, families with incomes at 60% of the area median income. They are proposing to uh, meet the minimum requirement. They're not proposing fee in lieu of or any of those other uh, tools. As part of providing those units, they are eligible for two or they're eligible for multiple uh, OHO tools and incentives under that ordinance, uh, but they are taking advantage or making requests related to two of them. So there's two requests specifically um, pertaining to their 60% uh, AMI units. One, one deals with a parking reduction. Uh, they're actually uh, exceeding the maximum reduction uh, with additional flexibility through the plan development. I'll talk about that during our parking slide. Uh, but they are seeking the maximum 20% reduction through the OHO uh, for parking. And we've talked about those different levels on other projects in the past. Um, and in addition to that, they are seeking a 75% uh, reduction in residential storage. Now the OHO would only uh, grant them eligibility towards a 50% reduction. So they are seeking a, an additional 25% uh, reduction to the overall amount of storage units for uh, the apartment. And so what that translates to is code would require if granted OHO uh, incentives and tools, they could have they would have had to have 203 storage units, they're showing 102. So again, 25% of the total uh, baseline requirement. The unit mix of the building, uh, it is uh, a large number of efficiency in one bedroom units as common to, um, uh, to the Fenley and Indigo certainly, uh, but it does have 94 two bedroom units, uh, which is above the ratio of those developments to my knowledge, and uh, does have 12 uh, three bedroom units. Here's the ground floor plan. Um, so it's a fairly amenity rich building, uh, mostly focused on the ground level. Um, all of the uh, unit sizes do meet our minimum requirements. They're not seeking any further unit reduction uh, through the OHO um, as far as the units themselves. Uh, again, you see the grocery store up in the Northeast corner. Um, again, the parking ramp. So this parking ramp is a shared uh, parking here on the ground level. So there is some parking assignment as far as guest parking for the apartment building as well as retail parking. So they are planning for that in terms of providing some signage and uh, communication as to provide, you know, maintaining ease of access for the grocery store. It's important for that uh, retail environment for that to succeed. Uh, and then uh, heading up here in this portion of the parking ramp, you can see that that's where they would gain uh, you know, resident access to the upper levels of the uh, parking ramp, which is secured. Um, other elements of the uh, architectural plans just to touch on here is that uh, because they are in a, they're still within a noise uh, area of the airport, there is a city ordinance that requires them to provide noise mitigation as part of their construction. They have to read it, reach a minimum average uh, 45 decibel, I believe, as kind of the, the, the target. And so that ordinance specifies uh, STC rated construction materials to utilize, or uh, they would have the option of uh, um, kind of producing their own uh, noise study uh, for the area. And uh, the city would accept uh, recommendations uh, from a qualified professional uh, as far as how to uh, mitigate uh, the noise in this area to reach or achieve that 45 uh, average uh, DBL level or decibel level level. 
So um, I think those are the only things I wanted to touch on with this slide. The building design, um, they're using a very complementary or similar palette of materials to some of the other developments in the area. So metal panel, uh, stucco, glass, as well as architectural concrete, uh, particularly at the grocery store. Uh, so this gives you a sense of on the left side of the slide, kind of uh, looking to the northwest towards that uh, grocery uh, tenant space. Uh, you can see that's a two story um, at that area. The northeast portion or the upper right portion of the slide is uh, just the, the apartment structure looking west. Uh, the slide on the or the image on the left would be the view from 30th Avenue. So this is looking east. Um, and then uh, the view at, in the, the bottom right portion of the slide is from the south, uh, from the kind of you can see that pedestrian uh, way on the south side um, adjacent to the light rail tracks. So certainly a very attractive building similar to uh, um, Indigo and Fenley and very complimentary. Uh, in terms of parking, so they are seeking a uh, PD flexibility um, uh, for the amount of parking that they would provide above and beyond the OHO reduction. So again, OHO does grant them a 20% reduction to their total parking requirement. Um, but that, that reduction, I should note, only applies to the residential uh, component or use of the, of the total uh, parking requirement. It doesn't apply to the grocery uh, component. Uh, and so based on that, um, they would be required uh, to provide 706 uh, parking stalls. They are proposing 622 parking stalls. Uh, however, that does not encapsulate all the on-street parking that it, uh, it it stems from uh, the amount of street parking that they're proposing that would be assigned to this development technically. Uh, other future phases of BCS would be assigned that uh, remainder of that parking in future phases whenever those were built. Um, so that being said, it results in 11.9% overall uh, uh, deviation from the city's parking requirement. Staff is supportive of the deviation requested based on multiple factors. First of all, again, those additional 37 uh, on-street parking stalls. So it's a total supply of 65. All of those will be constructed with the project. Um, they, they, are, they are there and they certainly would not be prohibited from using those stalls. If you considered those stalls, uh, the, the parking deviation would drop to 6.7%. Uh, another key factor is uh, the element of shared parking within the development. So certainly there might be uh, some communication and signage that relates to um, parking on site for various uses, but with any uh, mixed use component, there's always going to be some element of informal uh, efficiencies that are at play uh, with respect to shared parking. And that is an identified uh, area that supports parking deviation in the city's parking ordinance. In addition to that, this is one of the most transit rich uh, sites in Bloomington, having a uh, light rail transit stop you know, very close to your front door, obviously provides excellent transit service for uh, non-auto uh, uh, occupancy or uh, non-auto owning residents uh, is certainly very feasible at this location. Um, in addition to the uh, linkages to mass transit, which are also supported by code in terms of parking reduction, uh, there is still yet a backup parking supply. If you recall that kind of overhead or oblique photo, there still is a significant amount of uh, surface parking located to the north. Um, and certainly that won't be there forever, but in the interim period, it provides uh, kind of a backstop uh, in case uh, there is some, uh, some challenges with parking. And so just to note that uh, the Hyatt Regency Hotel, and this is as a result of previous approvals within the development and something that we're tracking, the Hyatt Regency does have rights to 123 uh, stalls elsewhere in the development, and it's kind of moved around as different phases have been developed. Uh, but currently it's assigned to that northwest phase uh, and so there are 286 parking stalls in that uh, surface parking lot so even subtracting the 123 stalls it still leaves you a backup supply in that area of 163 uh, parking stalls so a significant amount of additional parking um, that being said in consideration of that as part of the consideration of the pdp uh, additional analysis of total uh, parking, uh, off-street parking within BCS should be done and will be done in advance of phases five and six. That could res that could be in the form of a formal parking study. Uh, it could just be, uh, it, it really depends on what the developer brings to the table in terms of parking supply associated with those specific projects. Uh, so that's something that we'll be looking at. 
Um, and then finally, the, the final factor is that the other residential phases in the development have been extensively studied in the past prior to their uh, approvals, both the Indigo and Fenley. They had slightly lower uh, deviations associated with them. Um, however, on the basis of the findings of those parking studies, uh, again, all the things available to this development area uh, and just combining all those factors uh, together, uh, staff is comfortable with the level of parking uh, that they are requesting here. And uh, in effect, um, HXR is one of those districts where overparking a site is you know, strongly discouraged. Uh, you don't want to overpark uh, th this development. Um, and so in totality, we're supportive of the deviation that they're requesting. Landscaping, um, all uh, code compliant. The only thing we'll have to track uh, continue to move forward is again, the uh, McGough to their credit has been uh, helpful in working with fire uh, with respect to that Southern access to ensure that they have adequate um, uh, access to the, the, the courtyards and other areas of the development. So uh, we'll work with the fire marshal um, one last time to make sure that, uh, that they have the access they need. Um, another point about landscaping before I forget, there is a, uh, um, a South Loop streetscape master plan that the city did commission some years ago. And just to note that the planned landscaping for 31st Avenue, uh, again, a private roadway, uh, is in keeping with the, um, the guidelines or the recommendations of that study uh, or that planning effort that was done. The preliminary and final plat is pretty straightforward. They're just platting the, the Bloomington Central Station phase four lot, and then they're uh, creating three outlots. And again, uh, two of which are for the private street uh, areas, and then outlot B is uh, the future phases five and six. Um, so certainly they would have to plant those before those phases could go forward. Uh, other deviation that they are seeking, uh, they are seeking a deviation for the amount of ground level windows as it relates to uh, as it relates to the north and east elevation. The reason for that is that the HXR zoning district requires for non-residential uses. So again, thinking that mixed use component, whether it be office, retail, whatever the case may be uh, that mixes well with residential, those areas have to have a higher level of windows uh, at the 50%. And so one of the things that McGough uh, found in uh, their architects uh, ESG in terms of putting this together is that grocery, uh, not only because of the drop off loading area, they have to have all that back of house area uh, to load uh, product and, and other things. Uh, but in addition to that, grocery has even a higher demand of uh, um, retail stacking and shelving and all of those things. So they have certainly some product displays in the, the grocery entry areas. So in order to accommodate that uh, in a way that uh, the grocery tenant, uh, you know, finds acceptable and operationally works with respect to the, uh, with respect to the drop off and loading area, um, they are requesting a deviation to that uh, ground level window requirement. Now they are uh, proposing to make up that balance on the basis of providing uh, tr uh, um, opaque or colored glass as well as uh, art, permanent art. And so that what they're showing you in their project description, these are uh, images captured from their project description uh, where they're counting some of these areas of translucent or colored glass or glazing, um, as well as these permanent art areas uh, in order to meet that 50% uh, requirement. Now, technically that's not complying with code, but that's why they're seeking the deviation. Uh, but given the uh, kind of characteristics of a grocery use, staff thinks this deviation makes sense and is supportive. Moving on to their last uh, request for deviation. This was mentioned earlier. This has to do with residential storage. Uh, this is the one component of the application that the applicant and staff are not in uh, perfect alignment. And there are some reasons for that, hopefully good reasons. Um, but staff did provide you in our staff report kind of arguments for in favor of residential storage and against uh, residential storage. Um, the, app, on the basis of the applicant's request is uh, more having to do with uh, kind of the market dynamics of the type of residential apartments that they deliver to the market um, or are, are delivering here is based on their experiences in South Loop, but elsewhere uh, as well. Um, now, staff would argue that those, you know, kind of uh, levels of demand that they uh, have recorded and experienced are, do have some um, uh, connection to, you know, fees that are charged uh, with respect to on-site storage. Um, uh, there's a lot of different arguments uh, for and against uh, providing storage within 
uh, the within developments, it certainly adds cost or takes away, you know, area for that could be utilized for amenity or uh, additional units and, and those types of things. However, staff has found that it really does uh, uh, provide a good amenity for residents with respect to reducing nuisance characteristics or having to use offsite storage areas um, and allows for uh, kind of a uh, the ability to have uh, a more full living experience within a, an apartment unit. Uh, That staff is not, um, you know, not nope. cognizant or aware that that certainly said, uh, but uh, one of the, the reason that staff isn't being supportive of that uh, deviation at this time is that the city recently adopted an ordinance uh, revisions to our opportunity housing ordinance uh, that further incentivized the creation of affordable housing units by further reducing uh, or by um, uh, by further reducing uh, the amount of required storage. So there is a means or a pathway in city code uh, for the applicant to achieve uh, the requested reduction in on-site storage uh, without flexibility. And now that might be a steep level of uh, uh, provision of affordable housing, which would be 20% of units at 50% AMI or less. Uh, if you recall planning commission, you were part of that effort to make those changes to the OHO. So that's something you did look at. Um, so given that there is a pathway in city code, and this is something that the city looked at so recently, uh, it's not so much, it's, it's not uh, such a component that we think that the applicant is completely, uh, um, you know, out of turn or uh, that their analysis is completely incorrect. It just so happens that uh, the, the city just recently adopted new policies that allowed a pathway towards this and uh, created an opportunity to pursue uh, further reductions in storage. Um, if the planning commission uh, thinks that uh, you know a 75% reduction in residential storage is appropriate for this project, uh, it's something that staff would probably want to come back and just take a further look at uh, with respect to a study of our ordinances and our uh, peer communities and doing different types of development. Again, the storage requirement has been a long standing uh, um, uh, positive thing for multifamily. Uh, development in Bloomington. Not all cities require it. Some of it treat it more as an amenity like fitness room or, you know, other th other amenities within a residential building. Uh, but members of the, the planning staff do think that it provides a strong benefit. And I shouldn't just say the planning staff, environmental health, other uh, divisions within the city uh, are strongly supportive of providing on-site storage for residents. So that's the rub. That's the only spot that uh, the, the applicant and staff uh, differ. Um, and certainly uh, seek your opinion and uh, discussion on that item. Other than that, um, we're supportive of the other deviations that they're supporting, as well as the OHO uh, incentives and tools that they are requesting in terms of reducing storage to 50% uh, and uh, reducing parking, uh, as well as the PD flexibility on the window glazing. And so, uh, you know, similar to other residential projects, you know, just to reiterate what the, the tests are for OHO incentives versus PD flexibility. Um, the OHO incentive test is a negative impacts test uh, that the negative, the potential for negative impact outweighs the positive benefits. And the PD flexibility test is that the, the overall project uh, provides a public benefit. Um, certainly there's a lot of public benefits associated with this project. 36 units affordable at 60% AMI is a benefit to this area, as well as the provision of a grocery store in South Loop is a significant benefit. We have not received any correspondence on this application. Um, staff is recommending approval. I have three motions, suggested motions to utilize. Um, uh, should you support the project? And I know the applicant is available uh, for questions as well. Dave Higgins from McGough and staff can stand for questions too. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate uh, the review of the item in front of us. Uh, commission members, are there any questions for Mr. Johnson, as he takes a drink of water, and catches his breath. Um, Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Johnson, will you go over the 31st Avenue uh, connection again? Is that, you mentioned that it will not be a full connection north and south. Um, so I'm assuming that the parking lot of the health partner site is not going to be connected to the Thirty First Avenue. Would you just go over that again? That would be. 
Yeah, so this is the uh, thank you for that question, uh, Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Albrecht. This is the um, proposed preliminary development plan. So this would show you the final condition of what would result from the project. Um, currently, what they're showing now is they're connecting American Boulevard um, uh, to the south. They're constructing 31st Avenue from American Boulevard to the south to this turnaround, in effect. Uh, if you can see my mouse or my cursor. And uh, they have, they are constructing that uh, fire, that pedestrian bicycle access as part of this phase, but there's no roadway that would connect through uh, the light rail tracks until future phases of development occur with uh, health partners. Um, the future phases of health partners are located to the south of here. Uh, and so when those uh, future phases of office development were to uh, proceed. They've done they've done some of the development. They've done the parking ramp. If you're familiar with the area, they've constructed this ramp, but this future uh, health partners expansion office has not been constructed yet. So that would be uh, pushed through and constructed as part of a future phase of development. All right. Thank you. Any further yeah, there's, questions? There's kind of a, there's a zoom in of the, um, well, that's, that's still the preliminary development plan, I'm sorry. There you go, there's the final development plans. So that shows you the proposed condition of that turnaround. So the street would terminate. Um, this is this street here to, on where my cursor is, is the north side of the park and in between the hotel to the east there. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any further questions from commission member, Commissioner Roman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Johnson, are there any other uh, places in the city uh, outside of opportunity housing projects where we have granted waivers anything close to the 75% level? Yeah, Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Roman, I don't believe so. We Before the OHO was developed, we were, cons I shouldn't say consistently, there was multiple instances of supporting reductions in storage down to a 50% level. And that's ultimately what uh, was adopted into the OHO was kind of being consistent with some of that PD flexibility that the city was uh, approving. Leading up to that, there were reductions in storage approved for both, uh, for sure for Fenley. I, I don't recall for Indigo um, back in 2013. Uh, I'm sure the McGough folks could um, comment on that. But um, so we have approved reductions in storage. I don't believe down to 75%, but maybe Glenn uh, if I'm incorrect about that, Glenn, feel free to step in on that. Mr. Markgaard, do you recall at all? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, I am also not aware of any uh, flexibility to that extent. Okay, thank you. Yep, I think thank you. Uh, One other, if I could. Go ahead, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I, I believe I read my plans right, but uh, I was having trouble with uh, loading in my iPad. The refined version. You commented that the grocery was a two-story grocery. That's two-story in height, not two full stories, correct? Uh, of floor. Yes, Chairman Solberg, or, uh, Commissioner Roman, that's correct. Sorry for that confusion. It's just a, there's just a very tall, clear height uh, within the grocery space. There's no apartments on the second level uh, right above the grocery. Apartments start at level three. Uh, above okay, the so there's just one level of of grocery. Correct. That's my thought. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Roman, I think you asked a question I was going to ask myself and just a little bit of uh, maybe some history on what the <clears throat> Finley or Indigo, what we had granted for any kind of uh, parking flexibility, trying to understand that in relationship to how successful those have been. So um, if, if, if we're able to come up with that some point during uh, discussion that would be that would be helpful um let's see any other commission members have questions for mr johnson at this point not seeing any uh mr markagard is the uh, applicant available yes uh, mr chair uh, mr dave higgins is here representing mcguff okay mr higgins welcome Are you there, Mr. Higgins? Maybe we got to try the. Uh... Yeah, you're you're muted, Mr. Higgins. There you go. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are you getting any echo? Because I'm dialed in by phone. Nope. We are. Sure the... We are clear. You're good. Great. 
I, uh, uh, Chairman Silberg and commissioners, um, Mr. Mark Gargan, uh, Mr. Johnson, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of this project. And um, as uh, as Mr. Johnson said, we're very excited about this one, like like others. But we we feel like this is a great opportunity, um, not just for Magoff, but but for the South Loop District and and also uh, the city just generally. Um, it's been a really great. Uh, process as it usually is working with staff, um, you know, Nick and all the other departments uh, have been super helpful, public works, fire, et cetera. Um, so we're just want to express our thanks for that. Um, I, uh, if there's an opportunity, if you don't mind, I I'd like to share a very, you know, a, a brief deck, uh, if I might, just to walk through a couple items and uh, just give you a just give you a feel for where we're going with the project. Absolutely. Why we're doing it, why we're doing it the way we're doing it right now. Um, let's see, uh, are you guys, are you guys seeing this screen? It has not come up yeah. yet. It's just coming up now. Okay, great, great. Um, so um, Nick's shown you some pictures. Uh, already, I won't. Uh, I won't. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, I'll, I'll touch on it briefly in a in a moment. Um, we wanted to we wanted to address a, a few topics here and just share share what the vision is for the project and and talk about the unique nature of the opportunity we have with the grocery um, and what we feel is really happening out there and coming together. Um, and then, uh, and then, of course, as Nick raised, we we would like to talk in particular about the storage topic, and um, happy to field any questions about any aspect of this this project. Um, this project is is an outgrowth of some of the things that we've uh, experienced ourselves out at um, this area of Bloomington, with so many outdoor resources and, and great opportunities for people to get outside um, and and live the healthy life that people do in in Minnesota. Um, and, and honestly, it's some of it's an outgrowth of, of us working on the Fenley project and, and thinking about how we, um, make people more aware of the outdoor resources, like the trails and the, in the wildlife refuge connections to Fort Snelling and up to Minnehaha and, uh, just general resources in the area. And, and, uh, we think, uh, we think there's a, there's a great theme here and, and we want to go a little bit farther with it and create a almost like a lifestyle, um, a place that people can live and, and feel like they're paying attention to getting outdoors. And, and uh, so that's just generally the theme of it. Um, and, uh, and, and that'll be the marketing of it. And that's, that's where we come from on it. Um, McGough um, shares the desire of, of city staff and city leadership to getting a grocery store out in the South Loop. Um, We've, uh, we've attended many meetings together, collaborating and conversation with a lot of the different usual suspects in the grocery community. Um, uh, Shane Rudling in the port and myself and also others on our team have, have met with those grocers when we were doing the Fenley and trying to make something happen. And I know the city's been at it for 15 years. So this is, this is a really unique opportunity we have um, to, uh, to, to, um, to pull, in a, pull in a grocer um, I'll just sort of share some more images of, of the grocery element, which will be on the northeast corner. Uh, gives gives uh, gives the store some exposure um, from all the other developments in the area, but also uh, you see the grocery word on the side of the building in the in the uh, in the image in the lower right. Um, the intention there is not to overwhelm the neighborhood with signage, but rather to afford the grocer the greatest success by having some visual exposure up on American Boulevard. Um, you know, this is really intended to be what I've described here. It's, it's, it's really intended to be a destination. We had a lot of intentionality of designing it and putting it on the park. Um, we expect it'll have a little bit of indoor outdoor cafe experience where people can grab some food and enjoy it outside uh, or inside if the weather's not as, not as favorable. Um, but it's it's uh, it's product line will uh, serve not only people 
in the building upstairs, but other residences at PCS and generally in the area with all the growth going on, but also to serve businesses, um, employees to have another place to walk across the street, um, folks in the South Loop who are spending a little extra time in the extended stay or, or any of the hotels. And it is intended to have a liquor store um, as well, which is an added offering. Um, so, so we're pretty excited about that. I want to jump back a slide, not to go backwards, but um, part of uh, part of uh, the theme of this building is is really to to have a little bit more edge to it, maybe a little bit of a nod to the you know light industrial that used to be out here, but also have some of the same refinement and sophistication. So, those lighter areas that you see up above are actually a, a high quality um, uh, corrugated. Uh, corrugated metal look, but but uh, tempered by more of a charcoal, uh, smoother material on, on some of the darker areas you're seeing there. Um, you can also uh, see some of the windows and the nature of those windows are a bit of a nod to more um, loftier industrial, uh, uh, you know, spaces in, in, let's call it the other loop in Minneapolis. Um, so that's what we're trying to achieve. We, we, we've, we've gotten a good reception for the courtyard um, experience and drop off at the Fenley. And so we're replicating that here. We've worked with city staff, um, well aware of, of public works desire to have streets aligned. So, you know, Nick pointed out how, how this courtyard aligns with the uh, passageway in front of the hotel. So we're trying to do things here that continue the theme and the master plan out there, but also align with city standards as much as we can to create some success. Um, you know, why now and, and, and what's coming together out there? You know, I, I, I put this image out um, uh, uh, picked by uh, our fearless leader, Mark Fable. Um, it's a great image that uh, gives a feel of what we what we hope is coming together and will be well served and, and catalyzed by a grocery opportunity in this location where, um, you know, uh, it's not just an amenity, but it's a gathering place um, where people can see a neighbor uh, run into, uh, you know, uh, colleagues, that kind of thing, and, and have a real opportunity to, um, you know, create a sense of place and, you know, one way one way we talk about it internally is is South Loop is an area uh, with a series of projects, and it's starting to come together into a real sense of place um, and a real neighborhood. And uh, you know, no neighborhood is complete without some form of grocery or market opportunity for people, so that they can stay there and they don't need to leave for the daily their daily needs. Um, I. Uh, happy to field any any questions um i do want to jump to the storage topic and talk a little bit about um some market factors our thoughts around why uh, what why we continue to encourage the city to um have a look at 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 what the rest of the metro and its peer communities are doing around the topic of storage um, um put simply they're they're leaving that sort of to the private players who are, who are uh, you know, building these communities around the metro and in other markets as well. Um, al although we have not done a detailed study, we have a couple partners on our projects that that do national uh, work in in dozens of markets and um, aren't aware of other communities that have a storage requirement. Um, we. Um, We've done market surveys. Uh, we did back when we were entitling the Fenley um, to reduce the storage, uh, to address the storage requirement there that supported um, a reduction to 50%. Um, I'll share some data with you on how that is going and some further data we've gathered on other suburban projects um, that, that support an even further reduction, not only in terms of what the rest of the market is saying, um, but also specific to where the demand is. Um, you know, we, we have an ongoing public-private partnership with the city. Uh, it's a, Bloomington Central Station is, is multiple projects. It's a, it's a redevelopment tip district. 
Um, there, there are good policy reasons why the city's chosen to provide some subsidy support for projects. The challenge is these, um, we don't see a good choice in adding cost and, and components to a project for which there aren't demand and which merely add to projects and, um, you know, really directly would otherwise boost the need for additional subsidy where there just isn't the demand for it. Um, so, um, you know, the real impact of the requirement is it increases the need for subsidy and, and it, you know, in the absence of that, it would lower required returns and make it harder to make projects feasible. Um, at the Fenley, which is a good case study, uh, not sure what a better one is right now for this area. Um, uh, although we have a 50% ratio, uh, demand is steadily sat below 15%. Um, we, um, we're proposing to only build 25% because we believe even if, even if demand were to rise above 40, uh, excuse me, 15%. And I should say, by the way, currently we're at 47, just over 47% occupancy right now. So, you know, half the building is a pretty good sample. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, with 25%, with we're actually building in essentially what amounts to, you know, um, being able to accommodate a 40% increase in demand over what we have. Um, and additionally, as, as additional comfort, uh, you know, to the extent there are concerns at the staff level, we do have space in the building in the event demand exceeded uh, by more than 50% of what we're seeing at the Fenley, for example. Um, we would have space to add more storage if it was necessary. We just feel strongly that, um, you know, it's a, you know, the development community makes makes the predominance of the investment and carries therefore the predominance of the risk. And there's a considerable data out there that that supports this. I'll um, just close that piece before showing you some data to note that when we looked at what it would cost the project to um, increase to 50%, which would be the requirement given the opportunity housing um, ordinance that we're complying with. Um, it would add somewhere between 125,000 to $150,000 to the project. So um, you can imagine what that means if, if it's for a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and you know, one of, one of the conversations that we have just on the policy front is, you know, our experience over 20 years is Bloomington staff is, you know, probably the best one to work with in the Metro. Um, we have lots of collaboration, a lots, of, a lots of good work together. And I think you hear that in Mr. Johnson's commentary. Um, this, and, and I know there's a lot of discussion over opportunity housing and, you know, um, that was an outgrowth of a really, really good process um, that Eric Johnson ran, um, which, which was driven in part by market realities. And unfortunately, one of the market realities in the face of Bloomington otherwise being a really easy and, and, and pro, you know, the city, city staff always talks about, uh, and the port talk about being community builders. That's their job. And there's just not another community we can point to that that would otherwise impose a uh, you know five hundred to six hundred thousand dollar cost burden to a project of this scale. And just so you know, as as the city considers ordinance, we would encourage considering that. So just to wrap up with some concrete data, um, Great Star Property Management um, is um, you know by far by an, I think by a factor of three or four or five is the biggest property management firm in the country. They manage something like six or 700,000 units. Um, they took a look for us, they managed the Fenway. They took a look for us at um, some similar suburban assets that they're managing. And um, when you combine them all, the average um, uh, usage there is 13%. 
uh, each of those projects is supplying varying levels, um, but, uh, but that's the outcome. At the Fenley, as I said before, we're just over 70, 47% occupied. Um, and right now at, that's 161 units and only 23 of, of those apartments are renting storage. Um, that puts us at 14%. I think we might be, it's rounded to, it's rounded to double digits. So I think it's 14.2 candidly, um, but it's always the entire time we've been leasing it for the past year, it's been sub 15%. So um, we feel like 25% is prudent. Um, it leaves, as I said, a buffer of 40% demand growth without spending a dollar uh, extra in construction costs. And if we arrive at a place where there's more demand for it, uh, we have the space in the building uh, to, to, to expand that. We just don't see the justification uh, for adding something that is cost burden and not product, um, not a demand. So um, that's, that's all I've got and happy to field any questions or have discussion if people have questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Um, just uh, one question there as you continue um, on the issue of the storage. You say you have um, the ability to add additional. Is that um, in the level, and I'm just asking, uh, um, how many more units could you provide in that sort of space um, if, uh, if you we, had to? We could get to 50. We could get to 50%. You could. Okay. All right. That's... Uh, that's all I had for the questions. Um, any other commissioners' questions for Mr. Higgins? Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Higgins, out of curiosity, um, absent using that space for storage, I mean, uh, empty space doesn't uh, generate revenue. So uh, absent building storage in that space, uh, are there plans for that space? Because I, I appreciate the idea that you know it could be added. Um, but if it's not going to be added, there clearly should be some use of it that's going to generate income. Uh, it, it, it would be fantastic if, if every space in a building could generate income, but um, not every not every nook and cranny can. Um, I guess you know, I'm we have sur Yeah, we're, we have some surplus spaces that are, you know, oversized for electric in case there's something that's not contemplated. Uh, building staff on various floors. Uh, we'll keep cleaning uh, materials uh, and supplies uh, to, to, to do their tasks of maintaining the building. Um, there may be some equipment in there. Um, and we also, you know, we have, you know, one storage topic. I mean, we have an over, you know, aligned with the theme of the building, but is also storage. We have an oversized um, uh, bike and we're calling it sort of bike and board storage because that plays on what we're trying to accentuate as a theme, but that's an oversized space as well um, that theoretically could pivot some portion of its space for, for storage lockers. Mm -hmm. And also, as I'm sure you've seen it a number of projects, um, one example within um, Bloomington, I think is Genesee over by uh, Southtown and the Fresh Time, you know, there are these you know, you can put these cage lockers uh, on the walls above parking spaces. So the, you know, there there are a number of different options that could fulfill additional demand if it arise, arises. But even with when, in what we're proposing, there's a 40% buffer. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Abdi. Like you're still on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Higgins. Uh, the question is still under um, the storage conversation. I mean, I concur with staff's recommendation here, and I appreciate that there would be space for uh, expansion should there be a need. Um, a question I had was just for, say you run out of space, and residents who currently or may not have sp uh, space for rental end up stacking up their balconies for storage and that's not aesthetically pleasing. Um, you know, does the project management of the building, do you go and enforce, how do you like, would you enforce that? Or is that uh, enforceable thing at the management side or um, 
I guess that's one question. And then the other question I had was, you know, with all the housing projects that were built in this campus area in the South Loop, I know there are some condos, uh, there are several apartments built. Has there been, uh, have you done an inventory of all existing residential buildings just within the South Loop area to kind of determine if folks are maximizing the usage of the storage provided in their buildings to kind of see if there is actually even a need for it? I know you've done a, um, neighboring suburban property uh, sites, I should say, but has there been a look at just what's surrounding the area of development? Um, Commissioner Abdi, I appreciate your questions. Um, on, the, on the topic of the balconies, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, our, our building management and building rules don't allow um, tenants to have, um, you know, personal items on balconies you know, folks are certainly allowed to have, you know, a small sort of patio table and chairs, you know, some people might have a, a small plant, but it's, it's not a, it's not allowed to be storage in those spaces because it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's both unsightly and at a certain point it becomes, you know, unsafe. So that's not allowed at the buildings. Um, to your question about um, a survey or inventory of other projects um, out at out at Bloomington Central Station, in addition to the Fenley project, which is directly across the park to the east, where where demand is is under 15% steadily for the last year of its of its existence, um, it's our it's our understanding that. Um, the uh, Indigo apartments have have uh, vacancy in their storage facilities. Um, I can't I, I can't speak in particular firsthand to data on um, the uh, reflections condominiums, um, but I can tell you that we're in steady conversations with the management of of each of those properties, and I'm not aware of. Um, it, it, uh, for lack of a better expression, a storage crisis um, out there. And I guess one one thing that I would point out is um, there's no deterrent on leasing because of storage. Um, Indigo Apartments has uh, has main, maintained occupancy in the 90% range. They've got, I think they're at 95% or 96% um, at the Fenley uh, where we have, um, uh, you know, 50% storage ratio and only 14% of the people are taking it. Uh, you know, we've rented in the last three months, 85 apartments. So, you know, half of our occupancies ostensibly come in the last, you know, pretty close to the last three months and people are coming in and moving in and again, 14% of them are taking storage. So um, it, nobody's getting, nobody's walking away because, because of the storage question. It's, it's just not what's happening. And I would say, you know, you asked about balconies. Tenants aren't allowed to store a bunch of stuff in the garage either by their parking spots. That's also not allowed. All right, Commissioner Abdi, any further questions? Just a, another question. I know you have right. listed here the monthly rents. Um, what would the range be for the new project? That's a good question. Uh, we don't we don't have it set, but and I appreciate it. I didn't calculate an average here, uh, but certainly the average here is um, probably somewhere in the. $70 range, I suspect, something like that, 70 or 80. And at the Fenley, it's $50. Um, so I suspect it's somewhere in that neighborhood, still below what these suburban, you know, market averages are. Right. Any further questions, Commissioner Abdi? Thank you, Chair. I'm done. All right. Commissioner Albrecht? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Higgins, I have a couple questions and I'll start with the question related to storage. Um, 
we we were given sort of building layout, but not necessarily unit layout. And I'm wondering what kind of storage is in the specific units themselves. Yeah, so um, Commissioner Albrecht, I appreciate the question. Um, units um, units range in, in what kind of storage they have. Um, we have um, these anywhere from decent size to, to large walk-in closets. A lot of our a lot of our core size, you know, middle size units have walk-in closets. When you when you do an alcove or you know what a lot of people know as a studio size apartments, um, those aren't of a size where you could do a walk-in closet. It's, you know, those are in the low to low to mid or high. 500 square foot range, um, but it's also a, a practical reality that that folks who are deciding to live in a smaller apartment have less have less stuff and make that choice, um, and that's what we're finding. So um, it's usually a closet or two. Um, some you know on the mid and larger units where there are more people, uh, there is more substantial storage. And and I and I should add also, I mean these, you know, the kitchens are conventional kitchens with a lot of cabinets. A number of the unit types have have what are loosely called, you know, pantry cabinets. So it's a you know full height off the end, for example, of a of a kitchen that might otherwise not have one. Um, so that's there's a sampling of those as well. Okay. Any further questions, Commissioner Albert? One more question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Higgins, um, I'd like to go to the grocery store and I have a question about how you envision flow if someone is coming in uh, via a car. Where do you expect the primary traffic to be coming into and parking for the grocery store and expecting uh, them to exit. Yeah, um, Commissioner Albrecht, um, I'll try, I'll, I actually don't have a site plan at present, but if you if you look at this uh, lower left image and um, this uh, this lower right image, I can speak to a couple of opportunities um, here on the lower left. You can see a vehicle in the courtyard, uh, and there's uh, sort of a dark opening in the building. That's actually the entrance to the to the parking garage. Um, and the first level of the parking garage is intended to have visitor parking to serve um, the building and also the grocer. In addition, um, if we move to this right hand image on the newly created 80th and a half street on the north side of the building. There's a couple of uh, uh, opportunities. Just to the right of this image, there's another um, northern entrance to the parking garage so folks can get in there if they're coming off of 30th Avenue um, instead of 30, the new 31st that comes down from American. Um, but also where you see this white vehicle here uh, in the lower right image, there is uh, what what I would sort of best describe as a uh, elongated uh, tabletop uh, um, designed uh, speed bump, so to speak. Um, it's basically um, uh, 90 degree spots instead of parallel parking spots. There's a stretch of surface parking because it's envisioned that um, most people come in and park on the street there. Um, the reason I mentioned tabletop is the intention is we're we're creating an awareness out there that um, when you come to this area, there's a bit of a slowdown. So it it, it bumps up a handful, you know, six, eight, ten inches or something like that. Um, so that cars will feel that as they come in and slow down. There's also some. Uh, visual in, impediments. So at the back of the of the parking spaces, there's there's a band that will look like the street is more narrow, and it's intentionally a a, a visual um, effect that's been shown to be uh, 
but, um, to be productive and in, in slowing folks down. Um, so there's a primary interest there, which would be a shared vestibule between the, um, the liquor store and the grocery, which you would commonly experience kind of at a lot of grocery stores today in the market that have both, <coughs> excuse me, both those functions. Um, so you, you, we would anticipate that most people would pull in to that surface, uh, you know, surface uh, 80th and a half parking, but there'll be a considerable supply of parking within the first level of the garage as well for people who want to sort of get in there and maybe out of the weather or something like that. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Abney, it looks like you have additional questions. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, for the folks watching at home, Mr. Higgins, uh, if you haven't already mentioned this, who is the grocer going in? Uh, Commissioner Abdi, um, if, if, if you're willing to wait a few months, I'm happy to answer that question. We'll be here. Thank you. <laughs> not, not, not at liberty to say at the present time, but appreciate the curiosity and enthusiasm. <laughs> Well, Mr. Johnson put her up to it. So, all right, uh, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Higgins, just as I'm finalizing our due diligence on the question of storage, I just want to clarify, uh, you indicated a 14% take rate uh, at present. Uh, is that 14% of, uh, of those who are leasing? Uh, that's correct, uh, yeah. Um... Yes, 14% of the units are leasing storage or renting storage compartments. Okay. So so we have a we have a we have a we have a 50% ratio yeah. and 14% of our our tenants signing leases are coming forward to say, "Hey, we'd like a storage unit." Got it. That's helpful. So I'm just trying to extrapolate out it. You indicated you were about half leased. So that may put you somewhere in the 25 to 28% when you were fully leased, if trends continued. Uh, actually, no, that would, I mean, that would, that would stay at that number. It wouldn't be, it, it's not, uh, it's not 14% of the supply. Got it. It's, it's tied to the number of leases. Got it. Thank you. That clarifies. All right, any uh, further questions for Mr. Higgins on this from commission members? All right, and, and just to verify, Commissioner Albrecht, we're, um, the discussion of the parking and, and entrance into and out of, are you clear on that or would you like Mr. Johnson to bring up the site plan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That actually would be helpful. Okay, uh, Mr. Really Johnson, worried. can you do I'm that? Really I'm really, uh, my question was really related to circulation. Um, where, how do you envision circulation oh. on the site? Sorry if that was not clear. Yeah, no, uh, um, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, uh, Nick. I think, you know, our expectation would be people, uh, the majority of people um, coming to the site uh, to shop are probably coming down from American Boulevard if they don't reside at PCS. Um, you know, the hope of this whole uh, urban design out there is that this is heavily focused on the people who live and work at BCS and the broader South Loop. Um, but in any event, most people would come in uh, probably 80th and a half, either from 30th, whether they're coming East on Lindau or coming south on 30th from American, and they would come into the uh, western end of 80th, and from there they would either uh, choose. I mean, we would have it well signed. They would either choose to pull into the parking garage if, if that's their particularity of choice, and and otherwise they would continue and say, you know, surface parking. I'd rather do that, or um, if there aren't spaces, they'd run into the garage. Um, the other flow, I think, of significance would come down from American Boulevard and take a right into the surface parking because that's really the easiest 
thing to do, provided, uh, you know, if there's a spot, I think people are going to go into that and treat that as the primary entrance. And then there'll be a smaller number who maybe just got home and reside at Indigo or just, you know, they come in from, they come in from the north and they reside at the Fenley or something like that, and they're coming down 34th Avenue, they might cut through BCS in front of the hotel. We don't think that's the majority in the traffic, though. And in that instance, they, they might drive directly into the parking garage through the courtyard um, and walk in or, you know, maybe go up to 80th and a half. But for, for people who know the area, that's pretty circuitous and probably not the route they're going to take particularly with that building signage along the elevation on the northeast corner as a, as an enticement for traffic on American Boulevard. Great, thank you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, and just to clarify again, Mr. Higgins, uh, so that tabletop on the north side of the development, is that the only tabletop that's being developed as part of the um, – development or do you have some on that east side i can imagine as a grocery store that will uh potentially create a lot of pedestrian traffic so i'm wondering if that's um also on the east side no that's that's the only that's the only condition right there okay all right thank you you're welcome all right commission members any further questions for mr higgins Give it a minute here. It seems like it's generated a lot of questions, so. All right, Mr. Higgins, thank you uh, for providing that information for us tonight. We appreciate it. And Thanks very much, Chairman. Thank you. Commissioners as well. All right, uh, let's see. Mr. Markergaard, at this point, we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak uh, to this item? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, we have nobody pre-registered, but let's check in with Mr. Pease to see if anybody has called in. Mr. Pease, do you have any callers on the line? Uh, no callers for this item. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pease. All right, Commission members, seeing uh, nobody from the public. Uh, is will is wanting to speak to this item at this time. I'd entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Commissioner Roman. So moved. All right. We have a motion to close public hearing. Is there a second? Commissioner Albrecht. I think I heard a it is it was that a second? I'm sorry. It was, sorry. Second. Okay. All right. There we go. I just wanted to make sure I I was looking down and I didn't know if you said something and I missed it or not. So, all right, commission members, we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any further discussion before moving? All right, all those in favor of closing the public hearing say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman? Aye. Commissioner Roman? Aye. Commissioner Albrecht? Aye. Commissioner Abdi? Aye. And I for myself, motion passes. Public hearing is now closed on item number three. All right, commission members, uh, discussion on the items, uh, some of the topics before us. So again, a major discussion for us was the level of parking. And uh, just to clarify for everybody to make sure, condition 18, as written in the staff report, would require 50%. Um, a minimum of 203 residential storage spaces. So I want to make sure everybody's aware of that um, in light of uh, the amount of discussion we had tonight. So uh, any comments from any commissioners at this point? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my thought regarding the storage, and I guess we'll just start there, uh, is that... It, it seems like there's a, a good justification for a uh, a decrease in the amount of storage required on site. Um, I don't know what that amount is, but I do have a curiosity, which is why I asked the question about um, existing storage in the unit, given that units, and I think I've mentioned this at other meetings before as well, units have different layouts 
and different storage uh, in the specific units. Some have a lot of storage, some have huge closets, some have smaller closets and not a lot of storage. And so then require that offsite storage. I think that needs to be part of this conversation. I know that the individual units, their layouts may not be entirely planned or not 100% planned, but as a percentage of the total square footage, maybe that could be uh, an argument for not having as much storage on site. Um, I know these units are kind of pretty standard in size, given um, the you know the size of the units at the Fenley, the size of the units uh, at Indigo, pretty pretty comparable. Uh, I just wonder if that should be part of this conversation at all. And that's that that's my comment as of right now. Thanks. All right, thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. So, if I understand your comment is as much about having information about the storage in the individual units themselves. Uh, so, for, for for future discussion and maybe future information for staff to bring forward to us. Okay. All right. Good. Good comments, uh, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think Commissioner Albrecht raises a good point, and I I think if we proceed with this deviation, um, which uh, I'm somewhat inclined to try, uh, and staff, uh, Mr. Johnson indicated that staff would spend some time, well, would want to spend some time studying this requirement going forward. Um, that may be some next step in this is that, you know, storage is required when X, Y, or Z, or not required when X, Y, or Z. Um, you know, and another thing that came to mind, um, again, if we want to go to the 25% as has been requested, and we're hearing that the take rate is lower, um, obviously, um, probably long term, uh, the applicant is not uh, you know, being in the developing business is probably not going to hold the property, but um, perhaps there can be some sort of a, a negotiated agreement with the family who sounds like built at 50% and has surplus uh, where storage could be available to both uh, this project and that project, which then may potentially provide some sort of a, a relief valve should the 25% turn out to be challenging, uh, which again would be a way to try this out in a way that doesn't, you know, the applicant did say that there are places that they know they can convert. And I was, uh, I felt better about that knowing that, uh, you know, it wasn't just that, yeah, we've got this area over here that we would probably turn into some other amenity or, you know, another condo or whatever it may be. Um, you know, certainly we all know that there are um, building service spaces that change over time. Um, certainly, it's, I'm glad to see some level of grocery. I, um, what, you know, what that grocery is, is certainly not a, for me to play winners and losers on that. Uh, I was concerned by the size of this, of the footprint. I had a preconceived notion of what that store may be. Uh, the applicant talked about some of the services and amenities that they're planning to offer, which implies one of the more um, higher end groceries, but I haven't, want, given what we've seen elsewhere in the Metro, I, uh, my my only comment again. This is not a, a for or against the project. I, I I'm, I'm inclined to support the project, um, but you know this is not an area that probably is going to support two grocery stores. So um, I really hope that it's a grocery store that is truly full service and not a boutique specialty grocery store that provides some some groceries and some fun things, but not really enough to serve the neighborhood. And again, that is not what we're in the business of. Uh, choosing and winners and losers at the planning commission. That's just my opinion that we've waited a long time for this and, and what goes in here probably will uh, fit the bit, fill the bill for a long time in this area. So I'm hopeful. Uh, and that's where I'm at right now. My thoughts. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Roman. Uh, Commissioner Abdi. Uh, thank you chair. Uh, I concur with the, uh, other commissioners uh, feedback on the self, the storage portion. I'm still a little bit confused. Um, I, I would like policy consistency as we approve projects. Um, and I, you know, with the applicant mentioning that there is potential space to expand the units, 
uh, for storage, that is, and then also the fact that they do enforce um, balcony storage, should there be, you know, folks who are just storing, using, using the balconies as uh, storage facilities, um, you know, I, I'm still hesitant and maybe I'll just seeking a little bit of clarification from the comment that staff made earlier when they were presenting about uh, the recently adopted uh, policy uh, or is it an ordinance about, you know, incentives to further reduce uh, storage requirements to have more affordable housing, um, you know, without that, you mentioned that without that ordinance that we recently adopted, we have never reduced uh, storage to the lowest uh, to the to what the applicant is requesting. So I guess for consistency, policy consistency in project approvals, uh, I would like to be on that. That there, that's where my comfort level is to approving a project, so that um, you know we don't have scattered, um, we don't have consistency in, in what the city's visions are in approving the projects like these. So maybe I don't know if that's a little bit, if that's any clear. For staff to kind of touch base on just, you know, refresh uh, folks watching at home or, or for me at least, what you mentioned about the policy conflicts possibly if we do go in approving this recommendation, uh, approving what the applicant wants. All right, Commissioner Abdi, uh, Mr. Markegaard or Mr. Johnson, do you want to explain a little bit more about uh, the OHO? Uh, deviations and then the planned unit or the planned development uh, opportunities as well. And how that yeah, Chairman oh, Glenn, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? Either way. Sure, uh, Mr. Chair and Mr. Johnson, if you could pull up the slide that has the uh, pros and cons as I walk through it. But uh, very recently, the city adopted some code amendments to the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Uh, which did provide a pathway to reduce uh, the in-building storage down to 25% of the uh, citywide requirement. And that pathway is to provide additional affordable housing. So by providing 20% uh, or greater of the units at 50% or lower uh, AMI uh, today, the Opportunity Housing Ordinance uh, does allow a 75% reduction, so down to 25% of the units having access to storage. Uh, so that pathway is available, um, if that answers your question, Commissioner Abney. Yes, uh, it does, and that pathway is not what the applicant would like to take, correct? If I'm reading this correctly, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Abdi, that's correct. Uh, in this case, uh, the project has 9% of the units affordable at 60% AMI. So they would be receiving that higher level of incentive uh, with a lower affordability level. And Mr. Markegaard, with the 9% affordable, what is the, the ratio? Um, that's allowed 9% at uh, 60 AMI? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, 9% uh, at 60 under the affordable or opportunity housing ordinance allows for a reduction of 50%. And then 20% at 60% AMI allows for a 75% reduction. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Abney, does that uh, help? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, let's see, any further questions or discussions? Other, all, uh, as long as nobody's got their hand raised. You know, so <clears throat> we did go through a process recently um, to allow a greater percentage. And I think one of the things that, as the applicant talked, Initially, I was very much uh, in support of the 50%, and I think I, I still am, but maybe there's a different way for the Planning Commission to think about that in light of the information that the applicant has provided. And I'll just float this out there for uh, Commission members. Um, certainly, 
Uh, I think condition 18 says a minimum of 203 storage spaces located outside the unit um, must be provided in accordance. Um, I'm wondering if there's any interest to think about a reduced number and a proof of storage uh, that the applicant would have to show prior to um, uh, prior to uh, certificate of occupancy or, or permit in order to allow that flexibility, uh, but also ensure that in the future that the uh, potential storage s spaces or, or, or um, cleaning facilities are not uh, used up and that way it would be on record. So just something um, for additional discussion there. Otherwise, as far as the rest of the, the uh, development Certainly happy to see uh, a grocery store uh, proposed as part of this. We've heard this in a lot of our other developments in the South Loop area that we um, are in need of that. Uh, I think, you know, the, the nice thing here is, again, access to transit, um, which I think, again, is supportive of that reduction in parking that's being asked for. And then uh, lastly, I think just overall, we're seeing the vision of, of the South Loop being built out and can definitely, again, support that change uh, from office, which we've heard and seen over the past couple of years, and especially over the last year, uh, really take a downturn. So um, I'll kind of leave it at that. And if there's any other discussion from Planning Commission members, Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know we um, are in the discussion phase, and Mr. Markergaard can advise. Um, are we able to ask the applicant if they gave consideration to uh, a, a going to the the level of affordability that would have provided the seventy five percent? Mr. Chair, we have to open the hearing for that. Yes, you can ask that direct question. Yes. Yeah. All right. So. Um, Mr. Higgins, I don't know, are you uh, still on? If you would be able to answer Commissioner Roman's question about if you gave consideration to a higher level higher level of affordability uh, within the development. Um, yes, uh, uh, Chairman and, and Commissioner Roman, um, that's certainly something that uh, was a consideration for us, and I apologize for not including in my remarks about the challenges um, as a practical matter part of the um, redevelopment tip district and and public private partnership on this particular phase of housing um, happens to have substantial subsidy not purely for for the residential units and those affordable units that we are providing um, but it's also uh, been proven out over the last 15 years of effort by the city. Some of those years are also efforts by McGov to attract a grocer to this location. So a substantial portion of the um, subsidy that's going to the overall project is going to uh, support the grocery, not just the, uh, the housing in inclusive, by the way, of, of 36 units of afford, affordable at 60% AMI as it is, um, there, there just isn't the subsidy dollars that could be added to the project to go to that next lower level of income. Um, if, if, if we took the subsidy today and went to those lower levels, we would, we would not be able to do as many affordable units to be able to hit those lower levels. And our thought process is, you know, that's a, that's always going to be a tension there um, and a hard choice to make. Our thought process is on the whole as, as um, the city and, and BCS are starting to do more affordable, it's probably greater impact overall to the community to, to benefit, um, you know, 36 families as opposed to something meaningfully less because on this one we had to dip, dip deeper because at some point the, the city and a project can only sustain a certain amount of either gap on the development feasibility side or, or 
subsidy available that the city can justify on any one project. And we're doing, you know, the other piece is, is we're going into the next phase here uh, on the west side of the overall master plan where part of the infrastructure um, supported under the TIF is those, uh, those new roadways. And, and of course, with a grocery um, that's being served by those streets, that, that grocery has a chance to be that much more successful. And therefore the greater mix in the use and the, and the retail opportunity there um, is just that much stronger to catalyze that much more development, not purely at BCS, but in the South Loop district as a whole. Um, there's a whole lot more development available in the rest of the South Loop that will be more attractive to users and investors when there's a grocery out there. So um, it's a tough spot, can't do it all. Um, and it's been a long time coming to get this grocery and um, balancing that out with 36 affordable units, we feel like is, is, is a pretty good success, but that's why we couldn't go further with our affordability on this particular project. But I appreciate the opportunity to have you open up the comments again and respond to that question. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Uh, additional comments, Commissioner Roman? Yeah, I think, um, so here I'm trying to think through my, my evolving thought process on this. Um, you know, I think, again, there's the, the, the bigger question about, the, you know, demand for storage versus our, our standards and our, our um, code requirements. Um, I think we opened up some options with uh, the, the opportunity of housing ordinance for, for lower numbers. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the applicant shared uh, an estimate for, you know, the impact of their project um, to meet the 50% the versus the 25%. Um, and so my, I guess uh, I have a couple of further thoughts after the conversation. Um, I, I, I agree with Commissioner Abdi about, um, you know, our standards and how are we consistent? I'm reminded of um, Commissioner Goodrum, who used to be with us, who always asked the question of what precedent are we setting? Um, and, and do we want to make a decision that sets precedent? Uh, and the, the question with that becomes then, uh, if 25% is acceptable to a, to a, a regular, I say regular, to a regular project, uh, then that no longer is an incentive to um, to go to the higher level of affordability for an opportunity project. Uh, I am intrigued by uh, Commissioner Solberg's idea of proof of storage. Uh, what I wrestle with there um, is uh, what is the incentive down the road to provide it uh, versus uh, letting your uh, tenants know that uh, all the storage is is rented. Um, so not insensitive to the, the the plight and to the observation that it sounds like there is not a, a huge demand for that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think coming around on the conversation about whether we go the route of proof of storage or whether we go the route of this is our standard, uh, we can go to 50. I, I, just I'm not sure about the precedent of going to 75 and what that means for future projects or for the inability to use that as a tool for opportunity housing in the future. All right, thank you, Commissioner Roman. Commissioner Abdi? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, question for staff, I'm, I'm re, re, ah, excuse me. I was uh, reviewing the um, required findings for the application and I do not see a recommendation for denial on any of the findings. I guess my clarification is with us discussing them not meeting the required um, storage numbers. I guess where does that fall in in the applications? Excuse me, I haven't really read this closely maybe um of the applications that we are going to be taking actions on um and i might be jumping the gun with the <laughs> next step to this project uh, to this discussion is i guess what i'm trying to figure out is if everything if all the findings are being met um and us having a discussion about them not meeting that certain threshold 
um, where is that falling in the recommendations that we're going to be moving forward with? M Mr. Johnson, do you want to answer that and, and how that's uh, uh, constructed? Yeah, Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Abbey, thanks for that question. Um, right now, as it's currently constructed, uh, it's not so much of a findings issue. We, we feel the project meets the required findings of the city code for plan development approval. It's more so going to be per, uh, specifically tied to what conditions uh, the city attaches to the approval. So as uh, Chairman Solberg mentioned, con condition number 18 includes uh, uh, a quantity specific uh, of 203 storage stalls, which would meet that 50% reduction. Should the Planning Commission uh, want to support the applicant's request, you would lower that number simply down to 102 uh, storage units. So it's just a matter of amending the condition of approval uh, as opposed to whether or not uh, the project um, either positively or fails to meet the required findings uh, for plan development approval. So simply through the condition of approval. Okay, Commissioner Abdi, is that uh, helpful? Yes, thank you. All right. All right. Well, there, uh, um, with uh, Commissioner Cookton sitting out, it is uh, really five of us at this point. Um, any further discussion on this item? I know it's uh, uh, a thought process we're all going through, but I, Commissioner Roman, I think your point um, that you just made in your last comments about what are the incentives um, to get to 75% if we say, well, it, it simply is a matter of uh, whatever the applicant has provided to us and we think that that's appropriate for 75% reduction. We did go through a process that does allow a 75% reduction with that higher level of affordability. Um, so I think in your comments there, you've kind of swayed me to say that we should stay at the 50% um, and that the applicant, uh, and I understand the applicant's comments um, about that and the level of affordability, but we really have thought uh, quite comprehensively about that ordinance and what it does. And again, it's a living, breathing document. So um, at this point, I would support the conditions as they're written um, for the for the plan development. Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when I was thinking about this, I was struck by uh, Mr. Higgins number of 125 or 150,000 for a 25% decrease in the storage on site. So if they were to increase the 25% to 50%, it would cost them 125, $150,000. I can imagine that going to 20% of the units versus 9% of the units would be a much, much, much larger number. That doesn't offset the, the, the tool or the strategy that we have in the opportunity housing ordinance to do that. But then that, that makes me think of, well, is it actually a, a, a good tool? Is that actually gonna be um, enticing enough to developers to, to use that or to actually trigger wanting to move from 9% to 20%. Mm. Um, I think maybe not is my, is my thought basis on it. I think a developer, it sounds like Mr. Higgins, would, um, based on this project, would absorb the 125000 or $150,000 more easily given his, what the returns that he's looking for, or the investors are looking for, for this property, rather than the absorption of the 20% units. So then that leads me to say, from my perspective, I'm in support just on the basis of, I don't think that the storage component is a, is a enticing enough that decrease in storage requirement is an enticing enough tool to really get us to the 20%. So I would be in support of going of, of knocking, uh, knocking the requirement down to 25%. 
I'll leave my comments there. Can, can you say that again? You would be in support of uh, reducing the requirement to 25%. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Other commission members, we have two people with different opinions at this point. Let's see, Commissioner Corman, we haven't heard from you. Do you have any thoughts? One way or the other, we're going to finish this up tonight, so... All right. Well, we can give a, a couple minutes here for people to gather thoughts. <clears throat> a couple things as I, I think about your comments, Commissioner Albrecht, is... Um, that is something, again, we can go back and look at, but we do have an ordinance in front of us, um, and that's part of where I'm struggling with this, but to think that that is where we gave the ability to get the additional, um, I mean, it was pretty clear in the ordinance uh, to be able to give that, that flexibility. So um, that's, that's what's holding me, I guess, at this point. Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I would wrap around back to where I was headed before. Um, and I, um, I am, again, I not unsympathetic to the situation and to the, the data. Um, I just think that um, absent being prepared to make this a, a, a precedent, I'm not ready to go to 25%. Um, and, uh, you know, this project does have other subsidy through the TIF district or through uh, different things that the city has given, and and, and the applicant was was candid about that. It's that that money uh, is being used to help bring a grocery store there, which is needed and is a key part of of a bigger development uh, more broadly. I I agree with that, and that that's absolutely right. Um, and so I guess at this point, I would say, you know, our job is to look at. Uh, what are our standards? You know, this does go to the council. If the council is moved by the 25% argument, I would, uh, you know, they could make that that shift, but that's kind of where I am tonight. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner Roman. All right. Any further uh, discussion on other elements? Um, from Planning Commission members? Again, we're we're faced with um, again the preliminary and uh, major revision to the preliminary preliminary development plan. That's the change from office now to residential. Um, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't sound like at this point that there's any uh, issues from planning commission members on that. The second um, issue that we're looking at is really the final development plans for the 405 unit apartment building, which is I think probably where the storage uh, question lands. And then the last one is really the preliminary and final plat. Um, and again, I don't think anybody has uh, expressed any uh, comments against that at this point. So um, commission members, thoughts or Commissioner Albrecht? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in thinking a little bit about or more about this, I think Commissioner Roman is right. I think that um, keeping keeping consistent and then running it up the flagpole, and if the council, city council, deems it necessary or feels that it's appropriate to bump that to twenty five percent. I would be in support of that, but I I would be, I think it's important for us to move forward and I'm okay, obviously, improving it as is. I think the 50% reduction is 
is is great. And uh, if the council and I would support the council uh, in reducing that to 25 percent. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. And I think, again, part of the record for the city council is our discussion tonight and about some of the issues, uh, certainly that we're uh, considering under this tonight with the usage in some of the other facilities and the cost, um, the implications for developers. And so, um, yeah, that's uh, a good good thought. They certainly do have the ability to uh, look at this. Um, although I, it, as it is, it's a consent agenda item. They can uh, pull that off if they'd like and have further discussion. So, all right. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Mark, guard the chat's open there. I wonder, any other commissioners with comments? Or uh, Commissioner Corman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, when you called my name, I I could not find my screen anymore. <laughs> that, well, you know, that happens with this. Yeah. One day we'll be um, back in here together. <laughs> and I think I, I was also a bit confused with the recommendations since there is more than one. So sorry about that. Sure. But um, yeah, I think I'd, I would agree as well with the um, with that, that first one. Um, I like the different ideas, the, um, the, the idea of the, of the grocery store too. It sounds pretty attractive to me. And I also, you know, following on um, Commissioner Roman's comments, you know, hopefully this is something that serves well the community that will be living in that, in that particular area. Um, and yeah, when it comes to the, the storage part, I would also agree with following the standards. So I hope I don't get confused once it's my time to vote, but thank you. Okay. Thank you. And, and I, I'm a little surprised, Commissioner Corman, I expected to maybe an ask where there's a playground on this one. Uh, but we'll, we'll look for that in future, uh, phases for sure. Um, as, so in fact, I was hoping that maybe there would be more units for bigger families. Yes, <laughs> to, sure. to fit the that's families a, coming to Bloomington. That's a concern, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, commissioners, is there further discussion or does somebody want to make a motion? Commissioner Abdi. Chair, if there are no other comments, I can make a motion. All right, I'll look one more time, one more chance here. Any additional comments from commissioners? I think you're you're free to go, Commissioner Abdi. Thank you. Uh, in the case uh, number PL2021-57, having been able to make the required findings, I move to recommend approval of a major revision to the preliminary development plan of Bloomington Central Station to replace existing offices with mixed use, high density residential buildings, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All right. All right, commission members, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Commissioner Roman. Second. All right, commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us that uh, having been able to make the required findings, recommend approval of a major revision to the preliminary development plan of the Bloomington Central Station, to replace existing office uses with mixed use, high density residential building, high density residential buildings, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Are there any additional uh, comments? Any additional discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor of said resolution say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Abdi. Aye. And I for myself. That's unanimous. The motion passes. All right. We have a second recommendation. Uh, motion is uh, planning commission members. Anybody like to make that motion? Commissioner Roman. 
Mr. Chair, in case PL 2021-57, having been able to make the required findings, I move to recommend approval of final development plans for a six-story, 405-unit apartment building with an approximately 15,000 square foot grocery space located at 8100 31st Avenue South, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Roman. Commissioner members, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Commissioner Abdi? Second. All right. Commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to move recommended approval of a final development plans for a six for a six story four hundred and five unit apartment building with an approximate approximate fifteen thousand square foot grocery space located at eighty one hundred thirty first street thirty first avenue south, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Any further discussion on that item? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman. Uh, I'm a bit confused in this one. Uh, no, I, I believe it's no. Okay, Sorry. that's a no. All right, uh, Commissioner Roman. Aye. All right, Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. All right, Commissioner Abdi. Aye. And I, for myself, motion passes four to one. All right, commission members, we have a third uh, motion. If somebody was is willing to make that, Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In case number PL two zero two one dash five seven, having been able to make. The required findings, I move to recommend approval of the preliminary and final plat of Bloomington Central Station 7th edition, creating one platted lot and three outlots subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. All right, thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. All right, Commissioner members, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Commissioner Abdi? Second. All right, Commissioner members, we have a motion and second in front of us to move to recommend approval of the preliminary and final plat of the Bloomington Central Station 7th edition, creating one platted lot and three outlots subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Any further discussion on that? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Abdi. Aye. And I for myself, motion passes. All right, uh, commission members, that completes the three motions for that. And as we said before, this will move forward to the May 3rd city council meeting as a consent item. All right, that completes our public hearings for the evening. We have one item left, and that is consideration of the Let's see, April 8th Planning Commission uh, synopsis. And if I recall right, yes, I was the only commissioner absent that evening. And welcome back, Commissioner Cookton. All right, commission members, uh, again, the Thursday, April 8th Planning Commission synopsis. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Again, I was the only one that was absent um, at that meeting. Commissioner Cookton. So moved. All right, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second, Commissioner Albrecht? Second. All right, thank you, Commission members. We have a motion and a second to approve the April 8th, 2021 Planning, con planning con Commission synopsis. I'll get there. Uh, all right, all those in favor say aye by roll call. Commissioner Corman. Aye. Commissioner Roman. Aye. Commissioner Albrecht. Aye. Commissioner Abdi. Aye. Commissioner Cookton. Aye. And I will abstain as I was not in attendance. All right. Motion passes. Planning Commission synopsis from April 8th is adopted. Seeing no further business before us tonight, uh, Planning Commission members, that concludes our meeting. Mm -hmm.